Thank you, Dr. Karma, for the uh, detailed introduction. That was very sweet. Uh, Your Excellency, the Prime Minister, respected dashos, honored guests from near and far, and faculty and students of JSW School of Law, Kuzuzangpala, and welcome. I hope that all of you are as excited to be here as I am. My name, as has been mentioned, is Eric Lemelson. I am the president and founder of the Karuna Foundation. Tell me if I need to get closer to the mic. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we're a, a small private charity based in Portland, Oregon, in the United States. Uh, we focus on climate change, and we work exclusively in Bhutan, as I will explain. I was asked by the organizers of the forum to talk today about the connections between climate, philanthropy, and Bhutan. In my remarks, I hope to address the question of why we do what we do, which is fundamentally about intention and values. As much as I talk about what we do, which is about mission, approach, and impact. First, let me share a few stories, because I like to do that, uh, to explain the origins of the Karuna Foundation and its mission. Uh, my graduate work was in environmental law and policy. I studied e-law, that's what we called it, at a time when the world was just beginning to, to wake up to the climate crisis. Excuse me. Um, in fact, just weeks before I began my studies, a scientist named James Hansen, raise your hand if you've heard of James Hansen, oh well, some of us, um, testified to the US Congress about the threat posed to our climate by our profligate burning of fossil fuels. Jim Hansen's testimony affected me on many levels and informed my understanding of the interconnectedness of living systems and the climate, which is itself a living system that we all depend on. I started the foundation years later because I recognized that the responsibility for anthropogenic or human-caused climate change lies primarily with the developed world and the path we chose to industrialization. That path was based on the rapid and extensive burning of fossil carbon as the primary driver of industrial development and later of transportation on land use practices that relied on extensive deforestation, which substantially reduces the Earth's ability to absorb carbon pollution, essentially on pell-mell growth for growth's sake, rather than with human welfare and the good of all sentient beings at its core. In recent years, we have learned through the media that government and private sector scientists understood the causal connection between fossil fuel-based economy and climate change as early as the 1960s. Yet, our leaders, excuse me, our leaders failed to act decisively when the damages from climate change could have been largely averted by wise leadership, innovation, and especially buy-in from an informed public. Today we recognize that the developing world, which is least responsible for the problem, is suffering the worst effects of climate change. This recognition is at the core of what we now refer to as climate justice and was the central motivation for me to establish the Karuna Foundation. To put it simply, with an awareness of the connection between the developed world's choices and the suffering and disruptions in the lives of all sentient beings that are occurring around us, comes the realization that we have a moral and ethical obligation to act. In gathering my thoughts for today, I read a short book by His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama entitled, Our Only Home, A Climate Appeal to the World. It will not surprise any of you to know that His Holiness distills the core of what we now rather belatedly are calling the climate emergency into clear and simple statements that everyone can understand. I would like to share a few of those statements with you as I continue. On a responsibility to the earth, His Holiness states, and I quote, religion should not be limited to praying. Ethical action is more important than prayers. Caring for the earth is our shared responsibility and each one of us has a moral responsibility to act. The word karuna, I, I chose it, it means compassion in Sanskrit. For want of a better word, the motto of the Karuna Foundation on our business cards and our little website is compassion through action. This simple phrase and the foundation's name came to mind somewhat intuitively. 
Reading His Holiness's book over the last few weeks, I now understand more fully what my in intuition was trying to share with me some years ago. When I started the Karuna Foundation, I selected a board of directors who, like me, understood the developed world's moral and ethical obligation to help reduce suffering in the developing world. Together, the board and I chose Bhutan as the one place on earth we wanted to work. Why was that? I first visited Bhutan almost 20 years ago when a friend and I trekked in the mountains north of where we are right now. We were awed by the country's beauty and exceptionally intact ecological diversity. Since I was a teenager, I felt a deeply connected with core Buddhist values of reverence for nature and compassion for all sentient beings. Over time, I came to realize that Bhutan's ecological diversity and intact culture are the result of the wise leadership and the right intentions of Bhutan's royal family, as well as the embodiment in Bhutan's political leadership of good governance principles, a commitment to social justice and Buddhist values. In short, Bhutan was the obvious place for the Karuna Foundation to seek to apply our values in service of the Bhutanese people and the kingdom in the climate adaptation arena. Since the beginning, we've worked with Bhutanese partners as we seek opportunities to be of service in helping Bhutan and its people adapt to a rapidly changing climate. We also seek to help the people of Bhutan live healthier and better lives. Our early work, early grant making, focused on identifying local partners and doing a lot of listening. I found that humility is an important Bhutanese value and that humility informed our work. Some of the first grants were focused on capacity building and direct support of Bhutanese CSOs working on climate. Next came a network of climate, weather, and phenology data collection stations located at primary schools and created by the Ugin Wangchuk Institute for Conservation and Environmental Research. Is that a mouthful? Uh, also known as UWISER. We funded this network out of the foundation's desire to fill gaps in Bhutan's collection of climate data, as well as to add to Bhutan's understanding of the local and regional impacts of a changing climate. Thank you. Under the auspices of what became known as the HEROES program, I'm not gonna get into the acronym at the moment, uh, primary school kids collect climate and weather data while learning the fundamentals of climate science and understanding the impacts on Bhutan's ecosystems. Eventually, the program led to the inclusion of basic climate science in the national school curriculum. In more recent years, we focused on helping Bhutan learn about and adopt energy efficient design and building techniques so that the Bhutanese people can live healthier and better lives while conserving economically important electricity from hydropower and assuring that Bhutan remains carbon neutral as it develops. Energy efficient homes and businesses are much healthier, healthier to live and work in. I've been in quite a few Bhutanese homes and they're pretty cold in the winter, but they don't need to be, that's the message. Studies have shown that energy efficient homes and businesses lead to more happiness in the home environment and greater productivity at work. In addition, the building sector uses 42% of the total power consumed in Bhutan and this is something I didn't know till a few days ago. I read a, uh, another study. Uh, Bhutan purchases a significant amount of coal-generated power from India, especially in the winter. That's about 15% of the total energy mix uh, that Bhutan uses during the year. That's because in the winter, as all of you know, river flows are at their minimum and power production is cut. In other words, widespread application of energy efficient design and construction principles and practices across Bhutan will significantly reduce the kingdom's carbon emissions, ensure that Bhutan remains carbon neutral, and will increase gross national happiness. We've been deeply involved in the design and construction of the JSW Law School campus since the beginning of the project in 2015. Our goals from inception were to share key principles and technical knowledge about energy efficiency with Bhutanese professionals, help create or help begin to create a cadre of architects, engineers, and contractors who can apply these principles across Bhutan and provide the kingdom with a lighthouse project that can serve as a teaching tool and source of inspiration. As you can see, the campus incorporates the latest in energy efficiency measures while embodying Bhutanese architectural and cultural traditions. 
More recently, we've made a long-term commitment, as you've heard, to supporting the environment and climate change program here, and we intend to con continue that relationship. Over the last several years, we have begun supporting Bhutan's formal participation in the COP, or Conference of the Parties, Global Climate Negotiations, by providing funds for more Bhutanese climate policy makers to attend, as well as, ultimately, JSW faculty and students uh, to participate in the COP process, which is an annual process. The hope, or our hope, is that Bhutan can advocate more effectively for its climate goals, as well as share its unique story more widely with the global climate policy community, and I will explain our intentions in that regard shortly. So that is some detail about the what of our climate work in Bhutan. I will now attempt to connect the dots by sharing my perspective on the role of philanthropy in solving social and environmental problems, as well as more specifically in working to reduce suffering linked to the climate crisis. I will close with a few of my thoughts on the critical messages that Bhutan might choose to share with the global community. In my opinion, philanthropies exist to embody and actualize the values of compassion, caring, and altruism that define us as humans. In other words, to be of service to the community writ large. Philanthropies receive favorable tax and legal treatment under the laws of many countries. These policies are designed to enhance their ability to be effective change agents. I believe that philanthropy should aim to be servants of the people, to paraphrase a uh, Ukrainian leader who's in the news a lot lately. At their best, philanthropies can take risks in supporting innovative organizations, programs, and approaches that other institutions in society are unable or are simply unwilling to take. Small philanthropies in particular can be flexible, nimble, opportunistic in the best sense of that word, in part because they are not hamstrung by excess, excessive process or structural issues. Philanthropies, in short, succeed when they are good listeners, when they are driven by local needs and local priorities, and when their intentions are pure. I believe that we are at a crossroads in the climate emergency. While renewable energy has become the lowest cost form of power in much of the world, an incredible development which is leading to much more rapid decarbonization of our energy use than previously forecast, relatively little attention has been paid and little funds allocated to the need for adaptation research and application in developing countries, including Bhutan. The first steps towards progress in resolving the difficult issue of loss and damage are only now beginning to be discussed in international negotiations. While philanthropies cannot close these gaps on their own, they can lead, to, they can lead some of the discussions, take the risks, and choose to fund the work that ultimately leads governments, multinational institutions, and the private sector to act. I'd like to close by sharing a wee bit of my personal vision about the critical and timely messages Bhutan might choose to share ultimately with the global community as part of its contribution to solving the climate crisis. Once again, I would like to quote His Holiness this time on the subject of forests. And I quote, when the forests die, a whole nation suffers. And when a people suffers, the whole world suffers. We need forests for our health as well. When we go for a walk in a forest, fresh air is healing. I think we all know what that feels like. We need green forests. They are nature's great gifts. Forests are good for our soul. In the forest, we find calm that our brain needs for regeneration. Forests are water reservoirs home to many animal and plant species and are important as an air conditioning machine that we don't have to plug in. They are a mirror of the diversity of life. Under the wise leadership, leadership of His Majesty, the fourth King of Bhutan, the kingdom made it clear its commitment to long-term preservation of intact forests, forests that we now understand are critical to sequestering carbon. Bhutan codified that commitment in, in its constitution, and that, honestly, that's, that's something that still amazes me, because I'm not sure it's happened anywhere else in the world. Today, Bhutan continues to take that commitment seriously through planning, scientific studies, and enforcement. I believe the importance of this commitment to global efforts to save the Earth system for future generations cannot be overstated. In fact, it's a message that can and should fundamentally change the approach taken by both the developing world 
and the developed world where, believe it or not, we still engage in massive deforestation. Um, to forest management pointing the way towards a sustainable climate future. Forests are life, as His Holiness recognized. By preserving its forests and working seriously to integrate carbon neutrality into development planning, Bhutan has showed leadership that few nations can match. While challenges certainly lie ahead and the future will contain many surprises, all of us should work to assist Bhutan as it maintains good intentions and right action in the years to come. I will close with one last passage from His Holiness's book on climate and leadership, and I quote, perhaps you should lock up the world's most important politicians in a room for a while and pump carbon dioxide into it until they realize what climate change really means. Then they, they would probably very soon feel what greenhouse gases are doing to us humans. I often have the impression that politicians do not take climate change and the, and the environment seriously enough. Ignorance is our number one enemy. From everything I have witnessed over my years of coming to Bhutan, Bhutan doesn't need to lock up its leaders in that room. That's why the Karuna Foundation is committed to the kingdom and why Bhutan can address the climate emergency and share its learnings with the global community in a modest but very powerful and very important way. Thank you for your time today. <laughs>